of skateboarding, but you're just not very good at jumping up and down on your favorite piece of wood. Crab skateboarding, crab skateboarding, podcast. Daddy, can you teach me how to ollie like the goosh? The cashier? Nah, he doesn't know what he's doing. Can you ollie? Oh, I don't know. Show us, show us. Okay, fine. Watch and learn. Taking notes, Tony Hawk? That dude just got ass knife. I'm fine. I'm not done shredding yet. Daddy, what's an ass knife? Uh, uh, that's a different lesson. Dang, Josh. Can't believe they put a metal plate on your tank. <sighs> Skate dad is skate sad. Hello and welcome to the Crap Skateboarding Podcast, a weekly dive into skateboarding for the average skater, hosted by myself, James. And me, Jack. In this podcast, two distinctly average skaters chat to skaters from all around the UK who represent a huge range of different aspects of our chosen sport, from the weird and wonderful to the truly talented. Each week, we will be discussing a range of exciting topics regarding skateboarding in these uncertain times. And this week, Jack, our topic is... Drum roll, please. <laughs> skateboarding, skateboarding is a form of expressive <laughs> movement. <laughs> and we are extremely lucky to be joined today by a skateboarder, an academic, a university lecturer, a charity ambassador, and author, <laughs> Danny. Hello, Danny. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the question we normally start by asking any of our guests just is simply, could you um, give us a little background on yourself and your relationship with skateboarding? So I, I grew up in a, a town called Rugby, which is in the Midlands. Um, and it's uh, it's a kind of normal medium sized town with not very much um, scope for uh, exposure to alternative cultures, I suppose. <laughs> um, it's... Um, uh, there, there was basically I when I was a, a child I used to um, come home from school and kind of go and walk around town with my headphones in that was basically my entertainment and um, one day I was in the news agents WH Smiths and I saw this um, uh, magazine on the rack and it had a picture of uh, a skateboarder a male skateboarder um, performing a trick and, and I just was fascinated by this image and so I bought this magazine and kind of absorbed it. It was, it was Side, Sidewalk Magazine, which was yeah. uh, actually, until quite recently was like the leading British skateboarding publication and sort of absorbed all of this knowledge in, in it and um, decided that I wanted to get into this. And so I asked my parents to buy me a skateboard for my, I think it was like 15th or 16th birthday. And um, when the skateboard arrived, because um, obviously there was no skate shops in my town, so it was all like mail order. I positioned, uh, I think I got it with a 411 video and I basically like positioned the skateboard on the carpet in my parents' front room and like learnt how to ollie. That was like my first experience on a skateboard. So it's like not not that typical, I suppose. Um, yeah, and then sort of, um, I guess like a lot of people, uh, I skateboarded for a few years and then sort of dropped off a bit when I went to university. And then um, I, after I, I, I studied drama at university and then when I finished my drama degree, um, I sort of found myself in this, I suppose, sort of critical space in which I could, was sort of reconsidering the years that I spent being a skateboarder. And I had this new body of knowledge, which was all around like dance, performance, movement. And, um, and that sort of like then led me into my uh, sort of, well, I did a master's degree and then I, did, I ended up doing a PhD, which was like not, not about skateboarding, but was heavily influenced by skateboarding. It was all about how, um, how and, and why women don't feel supported to participate in play activities in public urban space. And so, and then that's, that's really been the basis of my career and that, that's kind of like led into everything else. So I'm sort of like um, yeah, skateboarder, skateboarder academic, I suppose. Wow, that is incredible. That's a wonderful title to hold, a skateboarder academic too. In, in so many ways, a very different background to the kind of typical uh, story, which a lot of 30 something skaters almost have identical stories and um, yours isn't and that's really that's immediately interesting 
I, I, I grew up, so I, so I started skateboarding around 1998 and anyone who um, was skateboarding in that period and in the 2000s would know that it was like not a hugely welcoming <laughs> sphere. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the local, the nearest skate park to us was Radlands, which was amazing because that's like really, uh, now it's kind of like this, um, it's considered like a, a skateboarding British skateboarding hall of fame sort of <laughs> kind yeah. of Le sorry. legendary park yeah legendary absolutely and um, and the people were lovely and I spent a lot of time there but you know it's interesting to think that I I was skateboarding at that age and I was regularly going to Radlands I didn't learn to drop in until I until about four years ago because I was so wow. yeah so like my entire skateboarding practice when I was younger was like curbs, flatland, and then like going to Radlands, but never having the confidence to drop in on those ramps and never having, and I don't, this, this is not that I like put it onto other people, but there was never that like framework within which someone was kind of really gonna push me to do it or help me to do it, if that makes sense. Um, which, which is not, like I say, it's not about like putting that on other people, but I just, I'm not, I, I am not someone that was very confident with my body about like skateboarding. Growing up in rugby as a young female skater, did you have kind of like a, a peer group of people you could relate to or was it mostly just hanging out with the boys? Like, cause it was a bit of a boys club back then. Yeah, yeah, there was, there was um, I mean, I made some friends with some like local boys that were like in, yeah, the area and we had like pretty, um, it's sort of interesting relationship because, um, at that age, you're, everything is kind of oriented around like you're going through puberty, you're kind of like, I don't know, you're figuring stuff out. And so this dynamic with me being part of the group was always a bit strained, I guess. Like it was kind of like, who, what, what do we do with her? Like, what? <laughs> I mean, just thinking now, because a lot of, when we spoke to Monica, obviously she found a lot of her freestyle friends through social media. When I spoke to Jane, and she spent a lot of her friends through social media as well. Mm. Um, and certainly back then, did you, did you find that, did you, were there any other young female skaters that you would sort of, you could relate to, or was it pretty much just you? I moved to Manchester, and at that time I wasn't skating very much at all. Um, but I was lurking a lot on the sidewalk forum, <laughs> which is like a yeah. forum for skaters. And, it's a bit notorious as well. It's like, it was a really, that was also quite a difficult space to be part of because mm. I I think I would often end up in arguments with people on there about like stuff they were posting about women. But it was through that, through the Sidewalk Mag online forum. And I also got a lot of support, some support from people as well on that forum. But I, I through that, I met a woman, Laura Powell, who, um, she's she's in her 40s, uh, I hope she doesn't mind me saying that, um, and she, <laughs> I, I sort of met up with her through the forum and started skating with her and it was like a complete revelation to me because we would go to the skate parks um, in Manchester and around Manchester and I would be like very shy and kind of like, you know, not taking my turn and she would be going, it's your go, take your turn. You have every right to be here. You've paid money just like everybody else has paid money to be in this school. And I, I, I have so much, I'm so grateful for having met her for that reason, you know? A really good role models I have, hey? Like, certainly. I was mm. sort of around those times. Because I, um, not, not from a gender perspective, but from, from, a, from a white heterosexual male perspective, the Sidewalk Mag forum could be quite vitriolic. Have you been on it? Yeah, yeah, we, we did, because we Jack and I used to make lots of videos when we were teenagers, and we'd upload them onto various uh, various websites, um, one of them being Tripod back in the day, and we'd link them to Sidewalk Mag, and yeah, they, 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 the, the responses weren't very pleasant, just because we weren't all that great. Um, but it was a weird... They, they, weren't, they weren't fans of Mongo pushes. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't, well, they weren't fans like of anything. I met this guy um, recently, uh, we were doing this coaching training and there was this uh, guy like, from the, who started skating in the 70s, it's like proper pool skater, he's got a pool in his backyard, one third of it is for, you know, like really serious old school skater. And yeah. we, we got onto the subject of Mongo pushing and he was just like, everybody should be learning to push Mongo. 
because you should be able to balance on every part of your skateboard. It's just another way of riding your skateboard. If you can't push one go, you basically can't balance on the back of your board. And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's my oh. kind of person. <laughs> so take that sidewalk for him. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> um, Danny, it seems from our brief conversations and Kai, it's, it's sort of being, um, almost touched upon by by your introduction and, and some of the things you've mentioned so far um, but you mentioned that a lot of your work um, across all your fields and you we, we can introduce them one at a time if you want or we can kind of weave them in but it seems you've you've mentioned that a lot of what you do um, really revolves around um, accessibility to skateboarding and mm. increasing and democratizing accessibility to skateboarding um, mm. Do you mind me asking, what issues do you see when it comes to accessibility to skateboarding um, currently? Currently, um, I mean, first of all, like I would say, things have really come on in the last even five years, I would say, like in lots of ways. But I think that at the moment, the thing I would most pinpoint about accessibility is the facilities that we have for skateboarding. Um, we're still in this realm where a council wants to build a skate park. They do a, a, a half-assed consultation with like, I don't know, five or six people. Three of them are like 14-year-old boys who say they want like an eight-foot like mini ramp <laughs> or something. Um, they're going to go off to university in a few years and never skate it. And then this the community is left with a skate park area that has stuff in it that no no beginners can use and i'm just so this drives me so mad like i i get so frustrated by it because people who are really super good at skating can have fun on small ramps you know and you should be building for the community that's around you not for like i don't know this like tiny percentage of people who are going to, because we're talking about public space and actually when you start to when you start to orient this the conversation more in that way and go you you've got like a a huge area of public space that is owned by the public and is for the public that means it's for everyone and you are this is in the middle of a city and you you if you construct something that basically is huge you are literally building women and beginners out of that space like that's simply what is happening, and I, this is this is I think like what was really gets me at the moment because I think the attitudes of skaters have changed tremendously from like two thousands, and people are so much more friendly now when you go to a skate park, and that's jumped down to lots of reasons. But yeah, I think at the moment it's it's the facilities and like making sure that there's skateboarding skateboarding areas that are just like good for beginners and good for everyone. As a lot of skate parks are built with sort of the idea of demos from pros in mind, kind of, and with building the most impressive architecture they can afford, with sort of little respect for the fact that actually, for most people, dropping in a six foot mini is a, is not something they're gonna do straight away. You know, and I, I really love a good skate park with like a little micro mini in it and a small little box and merge because they're fun for everybody. And to be honest, there's a park down here which objectively is amazing. Objectively, it's brilliant. It's got a massive seven foot quarter. The rail is about hip high mm -hmm. and the boxes are also about hip high. I've been getting 20 years and I'm intimidated by it. But very yeah. few people are actually using it. It's sitting them empty most of the time. That's really sad, that is. Yeah, where is that? Where that living? is Emerson's Green up in Bristol. Uh, okay. um, and there's one little block that's not that accessible and most people congregate around that a little flat ground area this is a nice little segue um into your work with the charity uh, skate pal um the uh could you well first of all could you describe the charity and the work you do with it but what what i'm really interested in learning a little bit about is um i know that you helped to design a skate park in palestine um and actually how your opinions about the accessibility in skateboarding informed the design and structure of the skate park well, actually, no, I didn't design that skate park at all. Um, <laughs> so, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, but I, but, I, I'll tell, but I helped build it. Um, and my my uh, contribution to the process because of my level of like construction skill was like GCSE intern on the building site. So I was literally 
shoveling stuff around and moving things from one place to another. It was absolutely fine and I was quite happy to do. Um, yeah, no, I was not involved at all in the design because, um, I, you know, at that point I certainly had, I, yeah, I didn't have any kind of like credentials for that. But um, uh, but one one of the other volunteers, there was a another woman um, who was part of the volunteer team who was an architect who she was she had some involvement as well. But I have to say that the the overall design and the accessibility of that skate park was really down to Skate Pal as a team and they they had a completely different attitude than I've ever seen in uh, really as skateboarders and I uh, got to know Skate Pal in 2014 I was writing up my PhD at that time I hadn't I wasn't skating very much um, I was sat in the library um, and I was kind of trying to write my finish my PhD and I was sort of getting bored and scrolling through my phone and at that time, um, Israel were implementing Operation Protective Edge, which was an, a military intervention into the besieged city of uh, Gaza, um, which uh, during which like more than I think 1,300 Palestinian civilians were killed. It was pretty horrific. Um, I'm half Palestinian, and so I have this connection to that part of the world. And I'm sort of like reading, I'm, I'm kind of conscious of what's going on over there. And I'm sort of like sat reading that. And then suddenly on my Instagram feed, I see this video of Chris Jones uh, performing a, a backside board slide outside a rail, um, out, outside a shop um, in Ramallah uh, in the West Bank. And I was like, whoa, this is a very different thing I'm seeing here. Um, what's going on? And, you know, I'd taken my skateboard with me on family trips to Palestine but as a child and so on but um but I'd never seen anyone else skateboarding there and I'd certainly never seen a professional skateboarder skateboarding there and so I found out and it, it was Sidewalk magazine actually that posted that video um so I found out that he that Chris Jones was working with Skate Pal on that and I got in touch with them and and then the following year I went out and helped to build the skate park in a, a town called Asira Ashamalia, which is in the north of the West Bank, quite close to Nablus. Because of the experiences I've had in skateboarding and not having felt historically very supported, I suppose, within skateboarding culture, my participation was sort of always waning, like on and off, not so great. So at that particular point, I've not been skating very for a while and I went out there on my own, met up with like these 20 skateboarders who were volunteering with Skate Power. We built this skate park. And I met all these people who gave a shit about stuff that was happening in the world, who cared about people in Palestine, which is a really important um, issue to, for me. And like people who genuinely were thoughtful about like, who is gonna use this park? How are they gonna use it? Um, you know, how accessible is it? Um, how are we interacting with this local community? And so on and so forth. I, it was literally like, where have these people been all my life? Like all these people are like the most wonderful people I've ever met. It, it wasn't just that it it reconnected me with skateboarding. It wasn't it wasn't that. It was also that like it actually reconnected me with Palestine as well because it was it was like this is an opportunity for me to actually go back to my father's homeland to sort of continue to kind of build a relationship, a citizenship almost with people there when I don't have any options for that because of the political situation there. My dad can't go back and live there. You know, there's, so it was a really like extremely profound experience for me to get involved with Skate Pal. And I think that the work they do is really excellent. So yeah, I'm really, I can't really speak highly, more highly of them. <laughs> an astonishing experience to have. That is, and it's amazing that you're actually going out and genuinely contributing. And have you found that the that, that these that the, the skate pal have had a big impact on Palestine? Because there's a really young population there, isn't there? And I yeah. imagine it's going to be really receptive to this kind of thing. Have you, has it been really successful? Are you seeing these facilities well used? Oh yeah, I mean the, the skate park is really used by so many kids, and what well, it's like that particular skate park was the second one that Skate Park built, and it's. Um, it's like a community hub. The, all of the families go there, they have picnics there while the kids are sort of skating around. It's got a completely different vibe to any skate park that I've ever been to in the UK or in North America or wherever. Bringing, I think, international volunteers to come and um, participate with the project 
is a really important part of what they're doing because Palestinians can't leave the West Bank very easily. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's a way for sort of creating that kind of exchange of culture that everybody needs in any part of the world that is, is good for, for development in all sorts of ways. And it means that, um, it also means that people are seeing the effects of the occupation. You know, they're literally seeing what's happening there for themselves. And that's the best way for people to experience it because there's so much difficulty around how the media report things um, in that part of the world anyway. So like getting people to go there and see it for themselves. You, I, you literally never get anyone going to the West Bank and come out and go, oh, I think the Palestinians are doing all right here. You know, that just never happens. You know, everyone goes there and they see it for themselves. So, so on the other, on the other, another part, entirely other part of the world, you're also, um, from what I've seen, you are a member of other groups closer to home um, <laughs> that uh, are also doing doing great things. So I noticed that you're well. You told me I won't pretend I, I've noticed that. You, <laughs> you have told me that you are the um, co-director of Skate Manchester. A few of us got sort of met up as a group and recognised that it would be good to have some kind of representation for skateboarders within the city that we live in. Um, and that's primarily because for a city the size of Manchester, we don't have a great provision of the skate parks. We, we have like a, quite a few like old dilapidated skate parks that don't tend to get resurfaced very well or that some of them are completely unusable or just not not great. Um, we also have two facilities that you have to pay to go to get into. We, I think that we had a shared feeling as a group that firstly that we wanted to kind of try to um, help to develop spaces that were free to access because we just feel that skateboarding should be free. <laughs> Basically, mm -hmm. anyone should be able to go and do it. Um, and also that um, I think we, because I, 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 as part of my work with sort of uh, academic skateboarding, um, I don't know if you know about Pushing Borders, which was a um, conference, skateboarding conference that happened a couple of years ago. Um, so I was part of the sort of group that were organizing like the academic strand of that. And um, it was a really beautiful conference. Lots of really interesting discussions happened there. And one of the areas that were, was primarily discussed was around like skate friendly cities and like making cities more um, open to skateboarders and active transport in general. Two of us who were at the, um, obviously took part in the conference felt like, oh, really, we really want to try and do something because we were following in the footsteps of like Skate Nottingham, Skate Southampton, who've already started these kinds of projects. And then looking at like the city of Malmo, for example, where skateboarding has been really integrated into the fabric of the city, you know, um, it's possible for councils to design things so that skateboarders can use them, like create spaces all over the city for, for skateboarders to use. So it all came out of that desire, really wanting to resurfacing and fixing the facilities we've got and building new facilities that are completely free to access you know that's that's the ethos of it really so obviously quite a lot of cities have got spaces that have kind of been taken over by skateboarders just because they are by accident skate friendly mm -hmm. so i'm thinking of places like civic in plymouth for example or plaza down in bristol um and obviously you've got like lloyd's as well this just happened to be like that so a lot of people obviously i'm very much in support of skate friendly cities you get people who are unhappy that skaters are kind of taken over these spaces or, or are present in these spaces so have you come up with much resistance at all to the idea of creating cities with that in mind or has it been sort of actually quite good progress towards encouraging people to accept that skateboarders are uh, a positive sort of uh, influence on the, on the architecture. But but my impression is that the council are pretty supportive of skateboarders and want to go in that direction. It's just, I suppose, getting everybody on board. And um, I think it's just really, it's difficult for the for, for that whole culture to change. Um, but, you know, um, I feel really strongly about this and it comes back to this idea of public space again. When we're talking about cities, we forget that we are the people that live in the cities and the cities are supposed to be for everyone and for us, you know? So the idea that like a user group is, is not integrated in some way or is blocked in some way just doesn't make any sense, you know? And like, okay, maybe, you know, historically, maybe when skateboarding was less popular and it was like this kind of weird marginal, you know, maybe subculture, whatever it was, um, that's a little bit more understandable, but skateboarding is not that anymore. Like it's, it's absolutely, you know, not. Yeah. And it's funny, isn't it? Because even generally, like, 
trying to persuade people that something like cycle friendly cities which has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years you know cycling has been a mode of transport for hundreds of years and you still get resistance against that so trying to sort of persuade people to accept skateboarders who historically for a lot of people have been considered a nuisance mm. i imagine is 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 something that can be quite difficult so all credit to you for kind of fighting the good fight as it were and kind of trying to persuade people to make it and i was thinking about this earlier and you've mentioned that the public spaces are for the public and for our for us to use and to be able to um sort of play and enjoy ourselves in but i was thinking about earlier that quite a lot of cities are actually private spaces masquerading as public spaces mm-hmm. privately owned land masquerading as public space just by virtue of you being able to walk through them which mm. can and often are very hostile to skateboarding and with that's something that is really problematic because the more and more that, that those areas get sold off to private land means that our sort of movement and our interaction with the city not just the skateboarders but human beings in general is more and more restricted and the issue is that like the more private businesses are kind of like taking control of public space the more our activity is funneled towards buying things um and kind of like uh basically contributing to the flow of capital in different ways um and my you know my argument really about um about bringing skateboarders into the city is not just about um yeah kind of like we should have access to space or like people should move more and and like that's a healthy thing to do but also like we need to see each other moving in ways that is different we need to like do things that resists that kind of very strict like capitalist um ethos of like you're here to spend money i like that an awful lot and again i and and you know it is so true isn't it i think it kind of comes back to what you were saying danny as well as the skateboarding kind of teetering this line always teetering this line between between being this sort of mainstream thing and being a subcultural thing and it's always sitting uncomfortably between the two mm. and it, as such i wonder if skateboarders in a way some of the things that i love about it and me as a consumer and how i consume it if we're our own worst enemy a little bit too in um the ways of public perception because i know that i like you know whereas where cycling especially recently has kind of got this very um this image associated it of being green and eco friendly whereas mm. a, a sect of skateboarding and probably the sect that i indulge in for better or worse kind of likes to roll around in this image of filth and um adorned in skulls and listening to like heavy metal and punk and kind of then in itself flirts with this notion of being a nuisance and i wonder if any of that feeds into wider public perceptions advertently or inadvertently and whether maybe people's opinions of skateboarding are still stuck in a time mm. or the results of an era where it was really proudly wearing that on its sleeve well if people are going to treat us like this then mm. we will indulge them in that and i wonder if there's still a hangover from that that affects public perception of skateboarders mm. yeah but i think like ultimately that's like basically a case of um trying to people trying to sort of create a monoculture isn't it it's like people going oh this is i don't like the look of that so therefore you know it's not acceptable um and you know that's rubbish i mean yeah no like it's really it's rubbish on like a fundamental human development or level like we're not supposed to all be the same and like we're not supposed to do all the same things like we need more different stuff going on different people like you know that's that's the that's the thing we should be fostering but it's more kind of me saying things back to myself where i i kind of often think that a lot of what we hear at the moment which is good about skateboarding in terms of the olympics and things like that i think that's really positive mm. but then there's a flip side to that where i think we've spoken to a lot of people who've almost accidentally or not have insinuated that that's because of an image change within skateboarding and that this is kind of th- this image is you know what it is but actually this this clean lovely thing is encouraging um greater respect from the outside and it's really nice to hear that actually that shouldn't really be as as much as skateboarding can be anything to anyone and should be it's exactly that it also maybe you shouldn't have to um make yourself more or, or make it necessarily more Mm. user friendly for people who oh. who wouldn't be interested in it in order to gain respect like you shouldn't have to you shouldn't have to bow down to people 
in yeah. order for them to respect you because then you've lost all of all of your integrity you know yeah absolutely and like you know that's that's really important isn't it it's not it's not about like creating well for me anyway it's not about creating um skate friendly spaces that are like all on the council's terms and it's all on all, all on sort of mainstream terms it's like no give us give us our space to be ourselves and to do what we what we're doing you know like even if that means that it scares the horse is a little bit somewhere or like it kind of you know even if that doesn't necessarily meet precisely you know what this person thinks should be happening in that space that's you know it's like it, that that's really important isn't it for people to see difference jack i don't know if you're about to ask about this but i was reading your profile and your phd was titled inscribing a gendered body in the public built environment mm. can you summarize that at all because i'm i i i I'm fascinated by just that sentence. Can you sort of summarise that as, as what, what what that was about and sort of what you... Mm. The full title was, Are You Known to Us? Inscribing a gendered body in public space or something like that. I can't remember that title. But the first bit, Are You Known to Us, is really important and I'll tell you why. Um, so I did my PhD in Plymouth. My, my PhD research was all about examining why it was that fewer women participate in public urban forms of play like skateboarding like parkour like um well i guess like rollerblading anything like that that happens in the street it's like a playful activity it just there's even and in fact it's really interesting because even though there's a lot more women participating in skateboarding now you still don't you still get fewer women participating in street skateboarding than you do like men so i was kind of like What's going on with this? Why is that the case? I'm interested in exploring this. And I was located in a performance studies department. So I did what is called a practices research PhD, which means that the, the method I used was a practical method. And so the, the method was that I, I basically would go out into cities and towns in England and play in the street. So I would um, like pl climb on street furniture, like play around with paving. It was kind of like just literally improvised free playing in the street, sometimes in costume. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that, and that was the, great. That was the research method. And then the data I collected was like stuff that I overheard that people were saying to me, interactions I had with people, and I was also journaling about the experience. So that was that was the sort of PhD research in its in its main form. So I was in Drake Circus because it was really raining, but that is private space, you see. Even, yeah. though, the, even though it's a through route that goes through the town and you can actually walk through it, it's a private building. So I started playing in there and the security were like on it straight away. And they were very like, they were really trying to move me on all the time. But they kept saying, if you tell me why you're doing this, I will let you stay. And I was like, I'm just playing. That's all I'm doing, I'm playing. Like, I, as part of the research, it was important that I didn't sort of like explain away what I was doing. The idea was that, that I would just tell people I'm playing, that's all I'm doing. They have to just understand it on that level. And so they just really didn't like the fact that I wouldn't tell them what I was doing. They, would, they, they weren't happy with the fact that like I was just playing and they kept telling me, oh, if you don't tell us why you're doing this, you're a health and safety risk. And this went on and on and on. And so eventually I left Drake Circus and I went out into the, the public part of the street. And after say 20 minutes or so of me playing around, this police officer showed up and the police officer said, are you known to us? <laughs> and I was like, uh, no, I don't think so. And then she was asking me like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm playing, I'm just playing in the street. Uh, so this conversation goes on and on. And anyway, um, eventually I did actually have to tell her what I was doing because it was getting dangerously close to her actually like removing me from the street, which is ridiculous. Oh, God. But what, what I learned from like that particular incident is that like, it's extremely easy to be radical in public um, space. Like when you divert from the, the way that you're supposed to move, in public spaces you, people are on you straight away it's very very difficult for you to divert from that and across all of the research the findings that i that I came out with were all oriented around um the way that mostly men but not always men in public urban spaces police those spaces for women by infantilizing and sexualizing what women are doing in public space so i had lots of experiences of that kind which uh, made me recognise that if you are a woman occupying a space, basically 
um, to sort of play or do any kind of activity like that, and you're encountering those kinds of experiences, then you're not gonna stick around, basically. That's the, that's the kind of long and the short of it. But I was also by playing in the street, I was sort of inscribing myself, my body, writing myself, if you like, into those spaces. And by performing a woman playing, I'm effectively kind of like, I'm, I'm effectively doing that thing and like being that, that woman that is doing that thing and effectively changing the way people perceive those spaces. And so that's where the sort of title came from. It was like, it's like you have to write yourself into those places if women can find ways to do it and hold space for themselves and to play in those spaces, we can literally change the way people understand and look at those spaces. And that's like, that's another reason why I feel really strongly about skateboarding because skateboarding is an expressive um, form of, of, of movement practice. Whatever you, whatever you think of it, whether you think it's a sport or an art form or a lifestyle or none of those things, it's an expressive physical movement practice. And when you're doing it, you're you're displaying your body in like a completely different way to what you would when you're walking down the street. And doing that is is a radical act. That is an extremely radical act within a kind of capitalist urban space, a capitalist hetero masculine urban space. And so, and so that's why women need to do it. That's why we need to see people performing differently all the time to sort of resist all of those processes. That makes so much sense. Yeah, that is fascinating, a bit depressing and not at all surprising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As well as your PhD, you have also authored a book, um, which has been mentioned on this podcast before. Um, it was actually what uh, really drew us to you at first, and then we found out all of these other wonderful things about you, mm -hmm. um, called Skateboarding and Femininity, Gender, Space Making and Expressive Movement. Um, a lot of these are concepts we've discussed heavily today and that, that they've already fed into um, a lot of what you've said but could you give us a little um, crash course a little bit of background on on that uh, yeah so the book is it has four chapters and um, the so the book sort of starts with revisioning the history of skateboarding because we know we know that the sort of dominant history around skateboarding is connected to the Zephyr team the Z boys in California and kind of that and obviously that all happened that was really interesting um, and but the first chapter of my book is kind of like let's look at that narrative next to what was kind of going on with or like how women were kind of um, intersecting with that narrative and like other types of skateboarding were intersecting with that narrative as well so like I, I write a, quite a bit about like freestyle skateboarding in it which had a much higher um, participation of like women and girls and um, and then I kind of look at how if you move through the decades like the the relationship of women to skateboarding is like quite complex and um, in some ways there's been like lots of kind of interesting support and then but in other ways exclusion and it sort of just tries to like maybe unpack and create a bit more nuance around that that idea and then the second chapter is called Skateboarding and Feminism. And it's really about understanding how skateboarding intersects with issues of feminism by looking at the experiences of lots of um, skateboarders, particularly women skateboarders. And I focus on, um, in that chapter, on experiences of um, uh, Letitia Buffoni and Leo Baker. Um, and kind of the ways in which they have articulated um, discussions that connect with with, femini with feminism. And so in that chapter, I kind of look at two or three different like kind of concepts that relate to feminism and like, and their, their sort of like work. And then the third chapter is, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like, it's all about um, skateboarding's physical culture. I think that might be what it's called. <laughs> I'm not sure, I can't remember. <laughs> um, and that's all about sort of like, Considering the question, can we can we understand skateboarding as a gendered practice? It was kind of like the starting point for that. So like, how do we look at the physical culture of skateboarding and kind of like unpack the gendered sort of connotations that are connected to that? So I talk about um, the sort of themes of like struggle and um, and sort of physical injury that are connected to skateboarding. And I also look at like the 
go quite a large section actually where I talk about Tony Hawk and the way that he, he, his body, his particular um, approach to skateboarding was quite different to the mainstream at, at that particular time and like the way in which he is our sort of articulated within skateboarding and um, and so that chapter is all about like the idea of bodily kinesthetic intelligence. A guy called Howard Gardner came up with this and then it was uh, someone else has kind of critiqued it. But it's the idea that we always think of bodily intelligence as being about like virtuosic bodies or bodies that are really good at something. Uh, and by doing that, we sort of like distance people from their ability to take part in activities. Because like, actually, if, if everyone understands that they have this body and they have this capacity for bodily intelligence, then like, then you can kind of like get people using their bodies in different ways. But we tend to kind of go, oh, I'm just not good. I'm not good at that, I'm not good at my body. And it's like, oh, game over, then we don't do it at all. Some of us would never do anything. <laughs> yeah. None of us would sing in the shower, put it that way. Like, exactly. Like, and, but it's interesting that a lot of people are put off, especially something like skateboarding, which is such a skill heavy, sports and that it requires a lot of skills that aren't necessarily applicable to day-to-day -day life or that most people wouldn't pick up from day-to-day -day life it requires a, sort of a high degree of proprioception it requires a high degree of balance um certainly on a, from, from a lateral perspective um and it, people aren't used to falling and we've discussed this before as it requires a willingness to fall that most people are averse to because it's not something you experience in day-to-day -day life um most of the time um but le le like learning any skill from a physiological perspective, your body is exceptionally adaptable and your nervous system can learn things very quickly. Neural pathways can form and connect very quickly. And even, even strength to a degree, initially building strength is a neuro adaptation before it's a muscular adaptation. And skateboarding, most of the adaptations that come from getting that skill aren't necessarily muscular, they're neurological. James, Danny just said a minute ago as well, and it relates to what you're saying. And you, you, this might not be what you're saying at all, Danny. So I apologise. But you touched on um, the kind of this mainstream narrative of skateboarding and the skateboarders that we remember. I know you mentioned like Letitia, for example, and um, you've done a case study of her and, and whatnot. And then you spoke about male skateboarders that we are probably hyper aware of in terms of like Tony Hawk. And I think that's a really obviously Tony Hawk is synonymous with skateboarding to so many people. I think he's a really interesting choice when we're thinking about movement because Tony Hawk, we forget because the generation that we are, James, because what, by the time that we got there, Tony Hawk was already like a god. But Tony Hawk was quite controversial, right? Because he didn't have a typically masculine body in the way that we're necessarily defining. So when he was pitched as a rival against like Christian Hoy Soy, for example, who was a very typically masculine I hate using these terms, but I suppose it's what, we, what we're what we thinking about, possibly, is that he was this kind of, like, muscular dude, you know, and Tony Hawks wasn't. Tony Hawk was a, he was a, 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 a quite lanky, frail guy. And I know that he got around a lot of it by thinking about things in an analytical perspective, yeah. for which Hoi Soy's lot historically mocked him for being feminine and effeminate, because he would do things like, Ollie into his airs, where Hosoi would just launch himself off the vert and suddenly be in the air, whereas Tony wouldn't because he didn't have the kind of strength to do that, but he did have the intellectual capacity to think about ways around it, and he was mocked for that. But actually, that in itself, even though Tony Hawk's obviously a, a guy, there's a sexism in that because the, the association of the yeah. way that he uses his body as being a feminine, a feminine expression, because he is thinking of it in an analytical, technical way, was so rife. And I think we forget that because I mean, Christian Hoysoy, he had his own demons, and he had, he went to prison for a while. And when he came back, the world had changed. But there was a time when Tony was really controversial, supposedly mm -hmm. because of the way he used his body. And I think it's really interesting, Danny, that uh, skateboarding has been this hypermasculine thing to the point where actually it's not even just about exclusion of women, but actually excluding people who you perceive to be effeminate in uh, the way they use their bodies. Yeah, and that's exactly the argument that I'm making in the book. This is not about women and men, although obviously it somewhat is, <laughs> but um, yeah, of it's about the exclusion of femininity. It's actually about mm. saying like, we, we're rejecting 
often, and not just in skateboarding, in lots of culture, we sort of reject femininity. The fourth chapter of the book is um, is, is all about skateboarding philanthropy. It was a, a term coined by, um, it's Paul, Paul O'Connor, who's another skateboarder academic. He came up with this term skateboarding philanthropy to sort of talk about, um, I guess, like the, the skateboarding charity movement in general. And um, so that, the but mostly it's talked about in terms of like, sport for development or uh, kind of sometimes peace building and, and those kinds of narratives and I wanted to write a chapter that was about articulating what skate power doing as a form of somatic practice so like linking it to kind of dance to the idea of like a sort of a, a practice that has the potential to be therapeutic that has the, but also that has the potential for the participant to determine what they get out of it the potential for development is really very much located with the individual and like how they see the practice and how they interact with, with other people. And I think that there's something really interesting about looking at thematic practice um, sort of forms and the, the like applying that to skateboarding and kind of going like, what do these participants get out of this experience? Like we don't need to put anything on it at the beginning. That would be interesting. So that's, that's kind of where the final chapter came from. It was like, I know it's got some like primary interview material with participants in Asira, Shamalia, where they're talking about their experience of skateboarding. It's like your, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying, but it's like all of the stuff you do just kind of comes together as one body of work in terms of a, in, in terms of your work with skateboarding. And that is only a fraction of the work that you do. But for the sake of this podcast, in terms of your work with skateboarding, all of this stuff that ties in together, would you say, do you have for people listening to this podcast who hopefully will now go away and do their own research and look at some of your other things do you have a kind of essential theme a message a mantra or a mission statement anything like that that you would you would really like people to walk away from this experience with is there something that you would like people to take away from our chat with you today that you would like them to 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 inform them going forward uh, this is the first thing that comes to my mind and it's probably going to sound rubbish but i'll go for it anyway um it's like, go out and be authentically you on a skateboard. Don't worry about trying to be anything or anybody or, you know, be, be open to looking terrible or like a failure or, you're, or just kind of like not really knowing what is, what is gonna happen. Like I think what I would say is like, strip away those layers and just be authentically you because that's like really where you're gonna get the most enjoyment out of everything. Beautiful. Yeah. Push Pongo, <laughs> do your weird tricks. Can you Ollie? Oh, I don't know. Show up, show up. Okay, fine. Watch and learn. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Take the opportunity now, just let us know where we can find anything that you want us to read, anything of yours, plug any works of yours, plug any charities that you like, plug, just go nuts and let everyone know what what, what, what they should be looking at, checking out and where mm -hmm. they can find find your things. Yeah, so um, first thing, like check out SkatePal, uh, skatepal.co.uk, so it's S-K-A-T-E-P-A-L dot co dot uk and have a look at the website, you can donate there, you can volunteer, obviously not at the moment because of COVID-19, but the volunteer program will be up and running again. Um, and you can see all the work that we do. Support Skate Manchester if you can. Um, have a look at our Instagram and we've got a website as well. That's, um, yeah, skatemanchester.co.uk. Um, and yeah, so it's just a really basic website, but you can kind of like get linked up with us there if you would like to do that. Um, if you want to like read my book, if anyone wants to read my book, uh, please do. And if you can't afford it, get in touch with me and I will provide it to you uh, for free because like, I don't doubt very much that the publishers will be watching, listening to this. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, you know, and, and like it's, yeah, bothers me that, you know, stuff is behind paywalls. So, yeah, and uh, let's keep in touch. And if you're in Manchester and you fancy a, a, a crap skate with me, then uh, come down. Absolutely. Likewise, <laughs> likewise, if you ever come to Southwest, let us know. If you love skateboarding but you're just not very good at jumping up and down on your favourite piece of wood, yeah.